live from downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and Click on Detroit. Local 4 News at Noon starts now. A swift decision and Oakland County High School shifts to virtual learning after several students test positive for COVID-19. We'll tell you what the district is saying about that decision. Plus, millions along the Gulf Coast dealing with the aftermath of Hurricane Sally, and we're learning about the first death from the devastating storm. But first, a big announcement from Ford this afternoon. Ford Motor Company that will bring hundreds of jobs to Metro Detroit. Thank you for joining us for this hour-long edition of Local 4 News at Noon. I'm Everett Cassidy. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sandra Ali. We are talking about a $700 million investment in the historic Rouge Complex in Dearborn. Let's get right out to business editor Rod Maloney to find out more about what this huge boost means. Rod? Well, we're here at the Rouge plant, and uh, there's so much to talk about here, Rhonda, because you first of all consider that the F-150, which is built here, is without rival the most important vehicle in the Ford lineup. Uh, and in fact, for the last, what, 38 years, has been the number one selling vehicle in the United States. And so when you bring out a new one, you better make sure you get that one right, and that's exactly what they're doing today. We'll show you the video as they rolled a new F-150, redesigned F-150 out. Uh, to much anticipation. Uh, it has a number of differing uh, new uh, items or features in it, including a, uh, a lock box, or a, a, a vault that you can put underneath the seat. You can also uh, have a generator in your vehicle if you want as well. So uh, just a few interesting items on the new vehicle uh, that we can talk about. But there's also another announcement that they're going to be building a plant because Ford wants to build the all electric F-150. They've got to get that one right too, knowing how important this vehicle is. And so they're going to build a plant here on the Rouge site that is going to be making that truck and it's going to be ready to go. The, the trucks will be ready to go in two years, so they're going to be spending the next year building this plant. William Clay Ford Jr., the executive chairman of Ford Motor Company, talked about it today, and he made this more about the Rouge itself than the vehicle that's going to be built inside it. For most of the last century, the Rouge was the cathedral of American manufacturing, the most copied plant in the world. And when it fell into disrepair, there were people who said we should just abandon it. But I knew that wasn't the right decision. I remember pointing out my window uh, to the Rouge and saying, if we really want to make a difference, we need to make the Rouge the greenest plant in the world. And so William Clay Ford Jr. believes he has now accomplished that feat uh, by adding now this electric truck plant. So much to talk about, so many details that we can give you, uh, but we'll have more on that coming up on Local 4 News at 5. Reporting live from Dearborn, Rod Maloney, Sandra, back to you. All right, we'll see you at 5. Thank you, Rod. Sheriff's deputies flooded a neighborhood in Superior Township for about nine hours after one of their own was shot. It's all over now, but we're told the Washtenaw County Sheriff's deputy who was injured is in stable condition. A gunman who barricaded himself inside of his home was found dead late last night. The sheriff's office says that early indications are that he died from a self-inflicted gunshot. Investigators say that it started as a dispute between neighbors. This is in the Lakeside Estates condos. Listen as one resident, one resident describes the chaotic scene. My kid started running over to help the cop, and I'm like, I grabbed him, and that other cop got him and would drag him up, you know, and then, oh, thank God he got up, you know, so he, I said, he must have his best time, he must have his best time, so I'm yelling to the kid, you know, and, uh, hang on a minute. Wow, so your son was right there. He was closer to me, but yeah. um, I was able to get a hold of him and keep him from running up there, because this guy kept shooting. Right now, we are trying to learn more about the gunman, and we will update you on the deputy's condition coming up tonight at 5 right here on Local 4. Just a few weeks into the school year, a local high school forced to shut its doors temporarily. This is after several students there tested positive for coronavirus. Novi High School is doing virtual learning only both today and tomorrow. This is after five students contracted COVID-19. Larry Spruill talked to school leaders about the decision. The doors here at Novi High School are closed today and will remain this way until Monday at least. Now, several school leaders tell me they had to change their hybrid way of learning because several students tested positive for the coronavirus. First uh, positive case uh, popped up on uh, Monday and then the other four popped up yesterday on Tuesday. 
Superintendent Steve Matthews with Novi Community School District says they were forced to close Novi High School for the rest of the week because of those five cases. Matthews says the Oakland County Health Department recommended it. It, it appears that the uh, uh, cause was outside of school. Uh, students, uh, you know, riding together in a car, students uh, being together on the weekend, uh, students uh, uh, being together without taking appropriate precautions of mask wearing and social distancing and those kinds of things. Novi schools chose a hybrid learning option for this year due to the coronavirus, but all students will go virtual the rest of the week. Here at Novi High School, we have about 2,000 students. So about 1,000 students are doing the virtual option and about 1,000 are doing the hybrid option. He says in the meantime, they will deep clean the school in order to hopefully open things back up on Monday. We did use some deep clean uh, fogger machines in some of the classrooms yesterday uh, to ensure that uh, our classrooms are as clean as they can be. Now school was not the only thing interrupted. Outside activities was also canceled as well. I asked the superintendent if he is concerned about more cases. I'm working on that part of the story all new tonight on Local 4. Reporting in Novi, Larry Sproul, Local 4. All right, thank you, Larry. The University of Michigan Graduate Employees Organization votes to accept an offer from the school and end a strike. The GEO, as it's known for short, was on strike for more than a week over coronavirus concerns and for changes to policing on campus. The GEO says that Michigan will address health and safety concerns, allow employees to appeal working on campus, and the university will temporarily boost child care subsidies. Graduate employees are back to work today. Now to the very latest coronavirus numbers. The state reporting 680 new COVID-19 cases in the past 24 hours with 11 more lives lost to the virus. Wednesday, we learned a two-month-old is the youngest person in Michigan to die from the virus. Meanwhile, Dr. John A. Caldoun says case rates in the Detroit area are dropping. However, cases are going up in Lansing, Kalamazoo, and Grand Rapids, where there has been an outbreak on college campuses. Students at Grand Valley State University are ordered to stay in place after 600 COVID-19 cases were confirmed. The order goes into effect today and it lasts 14 days. The state of Alabama has confirmed its first death from Hurricane Sally. Meanwhile, millions along the Gulf Coast are assessing the damage from the storm. Sam Brock reports from Pensacola, Florida, where officials are already predicting billions in damage. Florida residents reeling after Sally slammed the coast as a powerful Category 2 hurricane. It looks like a war zone to me. The storm dishing out a trifecta of strong winds, historic rain, and a scary storm surge. Yeah, this is the bedroom. The hurricane toppling trees onto homes, leaving many streets impassable and even ripping apart this bridge. Sally stalled over Pensacola for hours, dumping nearly 30 inches of rain in some areas and devastating business owners like Pamela Homiak. It just doesn't seem real. I can't believe this is happening. Her boutique hotel, the New World Inn, took heavy damage, and it's not the first time. Uh, yeah, there goes the canopy. Back in 2004, the hotel was battered by catastrophic flooding from Hurricane Ivan. I thought that was a once in a lifetime storm, but this surge seems and the flooding seems to be almost worse, actually, than what we had then. That surge prompting last minute evacuations, among them this boater who was forced to abandon ship. I never fooled with Mother Nature. She won, I left. Florida's governor incredibly reporting no fatalities from the storm. But there is going to be um, a, lot of, a lot of property damage. I mean, when you see downtown Pensacola uh, and you see three feet of water there, um, that's going to affect probably every business. Amidst the chaos, the community already pitching in. Oh, absolutely. Another month, it'll be all cleaned up. Tim Taylor helping to remove this tree, which landed on his 91-year-old neighbor's roof. That man lucky to be alive, moving from the bedroom to the den just moments before the tree crashed through his roof. At the marina in downtown Pensacola, nearly triple digit wind speeds and strong storm surge carried some of the boats behind me several hundred yards into a cluster right here. There are still 200,000 people in the state of Florida who have no power in their homes at the moment, but with wind conditions calming down, crews right now working to fix that. In Pensacola, Sam Brock, NBC News. Thank you, Sam. And of course, with more on Sally, let's get out to meteorologist Brandon Rue. Brandon is tracking what's left of the storm for us. And Brandon, we know the danger really isn't over just yet. 
It's not still flooding rains in parts of the southeast and this storm almost 16 years to the day from a stronger storm, Hurricane Ivan, that hit that almost exact location again 16 years ago. Now we have a loop of the radar over the last couple of days and the big problem was the slow movement for a couple of days there over parts of Alabama and the panhandle of Florida. Now moving into Georgia, still another inch or two of rain in some spots as it moves through the Carolinas. And, you know, we have a continued hurricane season through November and we're watching Hurricane Teddy. They name them in alphabetical order, so certainly a sign that it has been an active season. Category three on Teddy, likely to become a category four. The good news with this storm is that it likely heading into and through the weekend will take a turn away from the U.S. So that is the hopes for Teddy. We have temperatures very comfortably with sunshine in the lower 60s and probably middle 60s through the day. Even with the sunshine, it's a cooling breeze. Feels really nice out here today, especially, I don't know, if you have a birthday, Evrod. Happy birthday, buddy. This day is for you. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Brandon. I certainly do appreciate that. All right, we're going to hear from Brandon coming up in just a little bit. Also still to come, as the pandemic continues, both the U.S. and Europe are seeing a surge in COVID-19 cases. We're going to take a look at how the countries compare when it comes to its response to the virus. But first, deadly wildfires continue to hammer much of the West Coast.